Agency. We're here with John Meyer, who will be interviewing Tim Michael Cunningham. We're at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, and today is November 16, 2006. Okay, you'd like to start? Okay, well, we were especially interested in your uh, statement of your inspiration with Lindbergh and his success in 1927. And we didn't expand on that a little bit. Could you tell us a little more about your feelings and your activities that went uh, possibly toward aviation and technology? Well, I'm glad to do that, John and, and Karen. The uh, thing is this, that aviation in, 19, uh, in the 1920s, when I was uh, growing up, was in its infancy, as everybody knows that. And, um, it was just after uh, World War One, of course we call it the World War in those days because we didn't dream that there would be another one just like it coming, and a worse one coming. So it was just known as the World War. Anyway, I, I was fascinated with, with flying and the, the Wright brothers, of course, had achieved their remarkable um, event at Kitty at Kill Devil Hill and so forth and so on. And my parents were talking about it and I, I was like all the other kids. Um, uh, interested in, in something that was considered a daredevil event or experience. Only only the foolish or daredevils ever flew. And in and, and those days, the, the, the barnstormers would, would land in, in the uh, racetrack uh, area because it was usually a, a pretty level field. And even to this day, if you, if you go to any of the airports in the country and buy a sectional chart, You'll see the large airports like Lindbergh and Los Angeles and so forth with, with diagrams of the runways on it. But the smaller airports will have a, a circle. And that's a carryover from that racetrack. A little bit of trivia, but nevertheless, it's, it's a fact. And, and, and uh, a lot of the young uh, uh, pilots that I trained uh, weren't aware of that. And it's not necessary that they are aware of it, but it's kind of interesting anyway. So we see these biplanes land, and we, you know, as these young kids, we call them two wingers. The word, the word biplane was a little bit advanced for us, but the two wingers would come in and uh, land and take passengers up. And I had my first airplane ride, I think, on my eighth birthday. My brother and I, uh, we just begged my dad, and he, I think he said his rosary all the time that we were up in the air, but it cost, uh, I think, two dollars a piece. And that was a lot of money. Yeah. And Dick and I got in the, in the front of the cockpit, it was a, a, a big enough to accommodate two young boys. And uh, the pilot strapped us in and took off and oh, I was hooked from the beginning. Well, on that, I'm just trying to figure out what year that would be. I was born in 21, so it must have been 1929, and, and two years after Lindbergh's flight. And, uh, but, I, but I was, before that even hooked, I'd be over to my grandparents' house and and my grandma would uh, have a bunch of old apple boxes out in the backyard, and I'd, I'd make two winger airplanes, and oh. just a nail a propeller out with a nail, you know, it's just things like that. But uh, the 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 uh, day that Lindbergh flew the ocean, uh, I wasn't aware of that that, uh, that was happening. I was too young. I was only uh, yeah. I, what was I? Six years old. So um, I wasn't aware of, of, of the event, but um, when the reports came in that Lindbergh had landed at Le Bourget Airport in the middle of the night, actually it was like 10 o'clock at night, um, it, 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 every, the whole country was electrified, including, I was at, actually staying at my grandparents overnight that night. And, and this is St. Paul, Minnesota, by the way, I, I'll get up to that. And, and uh, uh, we were staying, staying, uh, staying overnight, and, and my uncles and aunts, and there, uh, oh, there were 12 of them, <laughs> and they were, they were, it's all they could talk about, Lindbergh, 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 and of course, um, it, it was just exciting me, and, and my brother to some extent, and, and I don't know about my sisters, but I know for me, I just talk about that, I, I would just, uh, it just overwhelmed with, with enthusiasm. So anyway, that, that was the, there was no question in my mind that I would love to be uh, a pilot myself, or at least 
an engineer or both. And um, so as things developed, I, mean, I went to a, uh, a ROTC uh, Catholic uh, high school and, and uh, we had, uh, you know, regular marching and all that stuff with rifles and I, I, I couldn't make up my mind whether I liked that or not. But the, the, in one classroom, in our, in, in our physics class, a brother had a full-sized engine, a real, a real radial engine in, in the room. And I don't know why he had it there. Same from yeah. the same. Yes. And, and I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, what, what are you when you're studying physics? Uh, junior or senior, uh, sophomore or something? And, uh, but I'd look at that engine instead of paying attention to my, what I should be paying attention to, I suppose. And, and, and thinking, you know, you know that I could be studying engines, and but as it, as it turned out, uh, I graduated in '39, and, and the, the war hadn't started yet. And I was got, I was planning to be a dentist. I was enrolled in college, all that sort of thing. And 1940 came, and nothing. But not 1940. Uh, yeah, 1940. I think the, the draft started then. I'm not too sure of myself on those years anymore, but we'll say 1940. Dick and I had to sign up for the draft, uh, and I think I was 20 at that time. And my, then I heard about some of my friends that, that were going up to Canada, which was our bordering country there in Minnesota, and, and joining up with the Royal Canadian Air Force. You only had to be 18, and I thought, oh man, this is great. And, and uh, so I, my dad wouldn't sign for me. So I'm not going to have my boys killed in an airplane, and you know that kind of stuff. And so anyway, <clears throat> we didn't do that. But on my 21st birthday, uh, I was sworn in the, the United States Army Air Corps, and um, and and Dad uh, approved. He and <laughs> he uh, uh, said, "Well, you know, you have to serve your country." And, we were released from the draft, and I was enrolled in the Army Air Corps uh, flight cadet program. And uh, but anyway, to sum it up, um, Lindbergh uh, was a hero of mine. Of course, I read all the books I get my hands on from the library on Lindbergh and and so forth. And he was still a young man. So he was only 25 when he made that flight. So he was in it. He was still. He was only in his twenties himself. I, I, I made it figure figure out he was sixteen years older than I was. Yeah. And and so <coughs> he wasn't uh, absolutely that far ahead, but far enough just the same. Because aviation was improving like everything. And first thing you know, there were one wing airplanes, and then the Ford trimotor came on the scene in 1928. <coughs> and <coughs> Excuse me, and um, I don't know. I think, and of course, Lindbergh was born in Detroit. Matter of history, and partially raised in Long Beach, California, or Santa Monica. I'm not too sure. And then, uh, and then, uh, when he was very young, his mother and dad were separated. And never, never got a divorce, but they were separated. And. He went to live on a farm in Little Falls, Minnesota, and, and of course now this goes back. This goes back further now. This goes back to to uh, uh, 1920 probably, and uh, or before that perhaps. Nevertheless, he, he, he worked with his grandparents on the farm, and he uh, and did all the things that kids were doing in those days, and he. His grandfather taught him to shoot a 22 rifle at, uh, at, the, at the game in the area when he was just a young teenager. And it was, it was fascinating. I, I just enjoyed that. Yeah, he was quite a biography. Yes, you? he was. And of well, course, that's, I think that's all I have to say about that. Uh, you were uh, an air traffic um, controller. Controller, yeah, and supervisor for quite a while, weren't you? you well, uh, <clears throat> yes. As a matter of fact, that was my career. I uh, a after the war, I was I, was, I got up quite early in 1945. I had all the points necessary to get out, 
And so, and I had all the readings. I built up a lot of time as, as a flight instructor, especially in the instrument training. And uh, I put my application in with uh, in two airlines at that time, Midcontinent, which was merged with Braniff later on, and Northwest Airlines, which is telling operations, as you know. And uh, you know, it was a year before I was called. And in the meantime, I, I had to make a living, of course, I was married and had kids and all that sort of thing. So, and I wanted to get back to university. I was doing, I was doing that. And um, I, uh, I had a, I had a, a job uh, working in, with Mack Truck Company as a salesman, but I wasn't too sure I wanted to stay with that. So then when some of my friends were saying, gee, you know, they're taking a lot of the pilots uh, uh, for their traffic control. So they said, uh, you have to go down to Chicago and uh, get interviewed. And then, so that's what I did. I went down there and he said, yeah, I just, it was just like this now. He said, you know, what's your name? Where do you live? How old are you? And what's your training? How many ratings do you have? And when he got all through it then, he said, uh, would you take assignment anywhere in the central region? I said, yeah. But boy, I'd sure like to get Minneapolis. He said, you got it. <laughs> He said, we'll call you. <laughs> so, and then, and then I went home and Northwest, my wife said, Northwest Airline called, they want you to come down for an interview. Now I'm in a pickle. And, and uh, I didn't know what to do. <clears throat> so I went down and I started up with Northwest as a co-pilot. I kind of forgot about the air traffic job because they hadn't called me. And uh, at that time, co-pilots were, were paid $150 a month. What year was this? 1946. Okay. And uh, $150 a month, and then, uh, you, you know, you were, you were in a DC-3, a 21 passenger airplane, uh, and the captains, of course, were, were really prima donnas in those days. The captain was making about 300 say about twice what the co-pilots were. And, uh, and, and, and they didn't consider anybody could fly the airplane except themselves. They, they, so you, uh, they, they say, you know, Cunningham, just sit there. I'll tell you what to do, but don't, don't touch anything. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and and it, it was on the job training, even though you had probably more hours than, 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 than he did. You were still, and they gave you your instrument check rides, and they had a, they signed you off every six months and so on. Well, I didn't, and, and they furloughed you. And there were so many, there were so many pilots from the war, Navy and Air Force. Oh yeah. That when business got a little slack, they would furlough you. Well, I didn't have any money, and uh, so uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't take it, and, and I, I said, "The heck with this airline thing." So I went to work as their traffic controller. I've never been sorry. It, it, the one thing about it, it, it uh, the, the physicals were, were hard, very difficult, and I, luckily I pass them all. But a lot of the guys couldn't, and um, over the years, uh, in fact, our physicals were... And you became a supervisor before... Well, I was in San Antonio. I, I was a, a supervisor for a while. But but mostly I was just a plain old a garden variety air traffic controller. So modest. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. But um, we, we, uh, it, it, it was a great job. Uh, we had a lot of... Uh, well, it's like, it's just like in flying, it's the same thing, hours and hours of boredom, you know, just boring holes in the sky. And the same thing with, the, with, with air traffic control, clear to land, clear for takeoff, turn right, turn left, blah, blah, blah. And then, bang, all of a sudden it's mayday, 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 and you got problems. Could be in the middle of the night oh, or yes. the middle of a storm or <laughs> But that, 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 it, it was a, a good job, we raised a big family and and uh, had moved around the country a lot. So, that, I'm glad it worked out. Any, any <laughs> questions? What was your most memorable experience as an air traffic controller? Like, what, what event can you think of that just kind of stands out in your mind? Well, I'll tell you, Karen, one, one incident that I still dream about occasionally <clears throat> was a situation in, in San Antonio. And it was in the fall of the year. And uh, I um, asked the, the chief controller if I could t 
take off until I, w I was scheduled to work the, the four and midnight shift. And in, 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 in San Antonio in, in October, November, the days are very short. So <clears throat> they, they were having their annual parade. I forget what the parade was now. But Carol, my wife, and, and all the kids, oh, Daddy, can you take us to the parade? Well, I, he said, yeah, you can, you can take off until 6, 6 o'clock. But we need you at 6, because the weather was terrible. And uh, so um, uh, I took the, everybody to the, to the parade. We had a good time. I took them home, and I, <clears throat> I drove over to the airport, went up in the tower, <clears throat> and it was very busy. And, and it'd be, it'd be, the ceiling was pretty good. But we controlled all the traffic for several airports, our own international airport, in Kelly, Randolph, and Brooks, along with a, an occasional approach into Stinson, a smaller field. So uh, the, 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 the supervisor that was on duty said, get down in the, in the IFR room as fast as you can. So I did, and, and there was about 12 radar scopes all lined up, and these guys were working. Some departure control, some arrival control, and so forth. So the fellow that was in charge said, Cunningham, take over this guy's job to get behind him to get his picture. So boy, he was very busy. And uh, uh, finally I, I said, okay, I got it. And I think I was, I was controlling the traffic coming in from Dallas and Fort Worth in that area. And what, what our role was is, is to descend them and vector them onto the ILS final approach course to the particular airport they were landing at. Randolph was always GCA, but that's another story. So it was a matter of identifying them and descending to, the, to a safe altitude and then vectoring them onto the ILS final approach course. I no more than sat down and I got this call from a very distressed voice, <clears throat> mayday, mayday, mayday. Cessna 62 Bravo, or whatever the heck his number was at the time, I have it on, still a copy of it, uh, were on top, and uh, um, I, 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 I got about 30 minutes of fuel left over, and, uh, I have to, and I'm not instrument rated, and I, and I don't know what to do. He didn't tell me that, that he had his little kid sitting next to him, and his pregnant wife in the back, and also he didn't mention the fact that he was an MD, a doctor. And later on in, in life I instructed doctors, and I don't get to that sometime maybe. But anyway, uh, here I am. I was thinking to myself, Ugh, why, why me? I mean, I just came from a nice parade, no, not this. But I'm stuck. And uh, so I, I asked, I, I called the supervisor right away. I said, give me a VFR. Uh, uh, airport. He said they're none. They're solid all the way in the, in the airport, in the region. So, uh, what am I going to do? I, I, I have to do something. So I asked the, I asked the pilot, I said, uh, seven, seven, Cessna, whatever his number was, uh, do you know anything at all about instruments? He said, negative. I said, do you have a, a, an artificial horizon? In those days we, we call them artificial horizon. The proper term today is attitude indicator. He said, yes, he says, I, my instructor showed me about that. I, I see it. I said, well, do you see the little airplane? And he said, yes. I said, well, I, where is it? And he said, well, it's, it's parallel with the little line, because he was on top and he, could, he, had a, he had a horizon on top of the clouds. And I said, well, now, I said, <clears throat> you were, I'm going to ask you to do something that is dangerous, and, but it's the only thing that, that, I, that I could think of. He said, anything. And I said, now, get that little bar centered right on, on, the, on the horizon bar, and, and, and then trim the air, trim, trim the stabilizers, the, 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 the uh, uh, elevator control, until you can fly hands off, and let me know what, you, what your airspeed is. And, 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 and also, I, I told him to turn to a heading of south. Just, just S, put, get, get on S, that's good enough for the time being. And he did that. He said, okay, I'm, a fly, I'm, I'm flying at 180, and I have a little bar, and I'm a hands off. All right, now I said, I want you to coordinate a turn, a very shallow turn, while you're still on top, 
to a heading of 150, whatever, whatever I thought would be appropriate to get him aimed at the airport. He's about 70 miles out, aimed at the airport, and, and, and one that would get him underneath the clouds. Because he had a pretty good uh, ceiling, I think it was about where he was, about 1,500 feet. But he had 6,000 feet of clouds to go through. So now I told him, I said, here's what you have to do. You've got to, you've got to roll in and get to, first of all, tell me when you're on heading 150. I'm on, okay, I'm on that heading. Now, roll in just enough forward trimmed so the nose will drop and that little, the horizon, the little airplane will drop slightly below the horizon bar and then tell me what your vertical speed is. And he said, well, it's about six or seven hundred feet per minute. And down. I said, all right, now here's what, here's what you have to do. Take your hands and feet off the controls completely and under no circumstances, no matter what you see on that instrument panel, touch the control, rudders included. Take, put your feet flat on the floor and, and, uh, and, and let me know when you're below the clouds. Well, and, oh, and then uh, if, if it's convenient to, to report when you're leaving each thousand foot altitude. So he said, okay, I'm leaving 5,000, and then he's in, he's in the clouds now, and everything is going fine, leaving 4,000, and then no, no other contact, and the first thing, you know, I could see on the radar scope, the target going like this, and oh, oh, oh. he's in a tight spiral, which is not to con be confused with a spin. And I, 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 I said, if you're on the control, take your feet, in, in, you know, and he didn't, did, nothing was said. And finally he said, I'm below the clouds, I'm below the clouds, I see the airport, I see the airport. And, and, and so I, I called up on the, to the tower, I said, I have this tower uh, one zero miles north of the airport, and uh, he's, he's, has, he's low on fuel. He said, we see him, we got a visual on him, and he's, he's clear to land. So I cleared him to land and didn't even tell him to turn out, to change over to the tower frequency. He just get him on the ground, so he's on the ground. And he taxied up and parks the airplane, parked the airplane. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, uh, then, then of course my, my job was just routine after that. And uh, the, the supervisor came over and said, uh, I'll take your place here, Cunningham. You, they want you out in the hall. I said, oh, shoot, I'm in, I'm in deep trouble. And here was this doctor. And he shaking my hand and thanking me and all this kind of stuff. Uh, all, I, all I could think of is, how could any instructor ever let you get by without at least telling you to check your weather better than I did? Put some, put, put, our, put me in a position like that. But he says, oh, it's one of, you know, I can't thank you enough. And, and uh, his wife was there, and she was obviously pregnant. And I never saw the little boy, but anyway. Uh, um, he wrote me a nice letter, but the next day I went down to look at the airplane and the wings were buckled so badly from, from the tight spiral that he was in. I'll explain that as quickly as I can. But the tight spiral made the wings buckle so the airplane was practically, well it was unflyable, but whether it was uh, salvageable is another question. And, and uh, it, uh, I got a letter then from, from Fort Worth from the uh, headquarters thanking me and all that. But the, the thing is that, that, that it, it could have turned the other way. Could, he could have not recovered from that tight spiral and it would have been a different ending to the story. Now, to explain a tight spiral, uh, for, first of all, to explain a spin is very simple. When, when you, when you uh, create a, a, a typical uh, uh, self uh, made spin, you, you you have a full elevator sticker rudder or sticker or wheel back in your stomach and you pull the airplane up into a very high angle of attack and then depending which way you want to spin you kick right or left rudder and the airplane will go into a spin and you're pulling one G. In other words if the airplane weighs seven thousand pounds you're, that's all it weighs, one G. And, and you're not going to pull the wings off. So now you execute an NAACA spin recovery, which is full opposite rudder to stop the turn and pop the stick, and the airplane will come out like this, and then you recover. Very basic. All airplanes can be 
recovered from, in that fashion. But a tight spiral is something else again. It's where, it's where the nose drops and the airplane starts turning. And, as, and, and the guy said, he said, you know, I saw that airspeed indicator, and said, instead of saying 80 or 85, it was, uh, I, I, it was up to 185 or something like that. And I wanted to bring, I, I wanted to lower the speed, so I pulled back on the stick. And all he was, all he was doing, as, as, as any instructor can, can explain, is tightening up that spiral. And he, he, he's exceeding the design limits of the aircraft, of the airframe, the wing. He's, he, in other words, if the wing is able to, to to withstand, we'll say, five Gs, five times the weight, instead of weighing 7,000, it now it weighs 35,000 pounds. Uh, in other words, the manufacturer may, may have manufactured it to withstand five Gs, but now he's probably six or seven Gs, and now the, the wings weren't made to stand that, and, and they buckled, and he was just plain lucky. And it, it, it augurs well for a Cessna. That's so, the end of that story. That's the most memorable <laughs> <laughs> moment air <of> traffic control. <laughs> How did you get here to San Diego? What, dear? Oh. How did you get here? Okay. I, um, I was transferred up and down here from Burbank. And I was working in the, in the Burbank Tower. And uh, uh, I was getting near the end of my working career, about 10 more years to go. And uh, this job became available. I had to take a slight demotion to get down here. But this was the only place my wife wanted to live. She, we were living in Silmar, which was all brand new at that time. It was very nice. We had our own swimming pool and all that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, she said, uh, I, I, don't like, I don't like this up here. But she did like San Diego. So I've been on, on, on this job and got it. And, um, <laughs> this was the easiest place to work I've ever worked. It's, it's a one runway airport, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And I spent the last ten years of my life working here, and, and then went back into flight instructing for a while, and glider glider school, and, and then eventually the work of the aerospace museum, the air and space museum, as it not known as. That's it. That's it. But all I got to say about that. Well, I guess we don't have notes for any more topics. Yep, Do you notes. have anything? No. Is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you very much. Well, no, I, I, it's just great. John, it's a pleasure. And, and I would say it's been a pleasure with all these years to know you. And, well, it has yeah. been a pleasure to work with you. <laughs> Thank you so much oh, for it. Yeah. You're certainly welcome. I, I can't think of anything to add, uh, Karen, except. I wish the Aerospace Museum well, and, and uh, it's under great leadership, and, and of course the, the docents are the greatest, and, and, and taking nothing away from the office help and this, all the other departments, but you have to, you have to admire the docents, and I, having been in many uh, museums. Well, when I was with you in the restoration group, undoubtedly yeah. I thought restoration was far the best. Well, it's a it's a case of, of what do they call it? mutual uh, something admiration. admiration, yeah. But uh, no, we feel that way too. As, in, as a matter of fact, when McKellar uh, hired me, or no, no, Owen Clark rather, Owen Clark hired me. I said, "You got the wrong guy. I'm a pilot and an air traffic guy, and I guess, what do I know about uh, running a shop?" You know. And uh, he said, well, I saw you well on the, uh, I've told you this story before, well on the spirit and said, give it a try. Well, that, that month's try turned, turned into 23 years. <laughs> yeah, you were a supervisor month. of the air traffic controllers, weren't you? No, no, I never was. No, I, I never was. No, that was, must have been when you were uh, we, in, the, in the service. When well, you were I, I, check I, I was a check pilot in the service. Yeah. But uh, it, 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 the uh, closest I came to being a supervisor uh, or a chief was in San Antonio. We were all supervisor controllers. Oh. We, we all took our turn of supervising, I which see. I thought was a pretty good plan because if some guy is, is hard on you one day, you know, he can figure out you're going to be hard on him the next. <laughs>
But uh, it all worked out just just fine, and I'm, I'm just a happy guy to be around yet. <laughs> well, we're certainly yeah. happy to be able to take advantage of your experiences. Well, I'll tell you something. It's the museum is, will always be in my heart. I talked to some of the fellows yesterday on the phone, and uh, we're going to lunch next week with um, Charlie McKellar, uh, Ed oh, McKellar's yeah. uh, widow. Um, great gal. Ever met her, by the way? And um, and, and uh, I, I I'm just glad that that uh, that, that you're doing this. And, and I, I was down to Ted Tarnasella's house a while back, and I would suggest uh, getting information. He he, he is just loaded with information. Okay. Well, we have arranged. Uh, for uh, him to